call May 2023 off till sorry for the slight delay but remember at the outset as I say always we have had a tough exam after many students staggering out of the exam after skull busting are scarcely able to remember their own name to get about them. So this is the first cut. First cut questions that we've got. Remember we've got the impressions. Impressions would be somewhat off target. Come back to it again. This is the first rough cut that I've got. I've got around five questions and let's do that one by one. And uh, since we are live, those of you who want to ask me some questions, we always want, please let's start that. Okay. We have this 2023 May and is set. And the first question is what are the following? Which of the following a direct Gonio score? Okay. We have choices one Goldman, two Richardson, three Zeiss, and four copies. Now, first of all, Gonio scopes are instruments designed to check the angle, the angle of that. The word Gonio means. And why we can need a Gonio scope is because you cannot see the angle directly because of the critical angle. So, the light rays, because of total internal reflection, they go back, they reflect inside. From the, why you cannot see the structure of the angle, that they reflect back into the eye. The critical angle uh, is, has to be have more than 46 degrees. Only then they can escape. That is why I require gonioscope. And now we have two different types of gonioscope. We have direct and direct. Direct, as the word says, you can see directly. So, you just go directly on the eye, put the lens onto the eye. Directly. Here, the patient is lying down. He's fine and you have a direct view of the angle. That's called direct gonios. But much more popular are the indirect gonios. Here, we see the angle reflected. That's why it's total internal reflection policy. So, reflected and this is much more easy for the patient because he's sitting in a clinic with the slit lamp and the indirect lens against his eye. We need a coupling media and we can see indirectly the angles. Direct gonioscopes are not that popular as indirect. However, since the question is a direct gonioscope, so we have to answer. The direct gonioscopes here are the Richardson and the Copy. So, we have this choice 2 and 4, choice C, correct. Indirect, the ones we that use are the Zeiss lenses and the Goldman. Because the Zeiss and the other Goldman are indirect lenses, means that we put them against the eye with the coupling media and see them through the slit lamp. And the angle is reflected indirectly. They're more popular, but the question is direct. The answer is two and four. The Richardson and the Copies. Very well. Next question for us is identify the structure marked here. And here we have a big problem because this is a structure which is you know, very small spaces around the lens and the vitreous. We have the lens capsule, canal of Hanover, Eagles line, and canal of Petit. And the arrow that have been given to us it seems to point towards space which lies between the anterior hyaloid fossa, anterior hyaloid face rather, and the posterior zonules. So the answer here seems to be the canal of the teeth. Now we will just discuss a little bit more. What does that mean? Okay. So remember the the, the question that I have been given, or we have been given the arrow points to a very small space between the post equatorial zonules and the anterior hyaloid face. Okay? So, that is the canal of Petit. And for that, for more clarity, let us draw the diagram and see details. So, suppose that we have the cornea here. Again, we need to be careful about this because cornea, the outermost layer of the eye, and iris, draw this uvia, red iris, ciliary body, Choroid and then blue one. Usually do the red now. Very well. So you've got the three layers in five strokes. We draw the eye and then we this. This is the okay. These are the zonules. Remember these anti zonules. Please remember this is called the equator. Okay. The lens, we have a lens like this. Fine lens, remember. The superior and the inferior poles we call the equator. So we have zonules in front of, remember, of the equator we call the anterior zonules, and we have zonules behind the equator called posterior zonules. So this is the zonules, and this is the iris, this is the body. And remember, the vitreous is sloshing about here. Vitreous is sloshing about all here behind the layer. Huge space. The vitreous is sloshing around, and this is a small space between the vitreous 
optical lens. Now, what the fine points of these cases are that between the anterior and the posterior zones, anterior equatorial, equatorial and posterior equatorial zones, this little space between the zonules that is placed anterior to the equator and zones as posterior is the space which we call as the canal of Hanover. Okay, canal of Hanover runs between. So that is how I used to memorize Han and runs. Okay, Han and runs. Canal of Hanover runs between the small space between anterior and the posterior zonules. Okay, so that's one. Now, this is therefore, the, but there's another space, space between the anterior hyalid fossa or face rather and the posterior zonules, this little space. And that question pointed to that, and this is the canal of Petit. Petit, P E T I T, Petit means small in French, and because it's very small space, a very little space between the zonules and the antihyaloid face, this is the canal. The question seems to point at that. And that is the canal of Petit. Okay, then we have another choice. As the question says, you know what the lens capsule is. What is Eggers line? The Eggers line, this one, remember where the, this is the vitreous and this is the posterior capsule. So when the, there is a Vigors ligament here, and the Eggers line is a small oval line, small oval line where the Vigors ligament attaches on the posterior. The small space, this small circular line, which is the Space for the posterior capsule and the vigorous ligament to join together. This is called the Eggers line. Often vitreous hemorrhage starts there. Vitreous hemorrhage, remember, this is part of vitreous, starts there. That's the importance of the Eggers line. But the question where the arrow seems to point here seems to point to the canal of Petit. Okay, so the answer is here canal of Petit. Not easy, mind you, not easy at all. Question number three this is the first of the clinical questions, which of the following is true regarding perimetry. Perimeter remember visual fields and the earliest and the most specific features of glaucoma are constriction of the isopters and bearing of the blind spot. Is this true or not? It is incorrect. Remember, the, neither are the early nor the most specific features of glaucoma. Constriction of isopters bearing of blind spots are actually very non-specific. They are field, but they can be seen in other conditions also. So they are not the specific features of glaucoma, and neither are the earliest. Choice B kinetic perimetry is best for monitoring visual field changes in a patient diagnosed with glaucoma. Incorrect. Again, please remember kinetic, but remember the basic difference between static and kinetic types of perimetry. Perimetry, visual field, and now visual field basically checks the optic nerve function. I ask you a question, what is the single best, what is the single best method of examination for assessing the function of the optic nerve and the answer is perimetry. So, the difference between visual field and vision is very intricate. Remember vision is straight ahead that is testing the function of ovia and the macula. Visual field is an area of space that is testing the optic nerve. And remember, visual field is not the same, though so it is allied to the vision, but it is perfectly possible for you to have a very poor visual field and yet you have very good vision. They are not the same at all. They sound similar, vision and visual field. And remember, vision tests your fovea and macula, visual tests the function of the optic nerve. So in visual field perimetry, Static and kinetic. Now look at the word. Static means that we test the field. Uh, there is a spot here, does not move because it's static, so it does not move. So we what we do, we ask the patient, can you see that spot? Okay. Now this is a brief, this spot is a standard size, it's size three of gold. And the illumination we can reduce, we can increase. But it will not move, and this glows only for a brief second, say around 0 0.2 seconds. Humphreys at least. Only 0.2 seconds. You are exposed to this light only for 0.2 seconds. And if the patient can see it, he clicks on the remote. If he can't see it, doesn't click. So then we can increase or decrease the density of the light stimulus. This is called static perimetry. Why? Because the point of light is moving. In kinetic perimetry, however, the stimulus is moving. So we typically take a stimulus from the periphery, non seeing area, and give it. So this, so we first. Uh, in kinetic perimetry, the sort of stimulus, it moves from a non-seeing area to a seeing at a certain point as the patient starts seeing it, fix that. The basic difference between static and kinetic movement, right? Now, please remember for glaucoma, static perimetry is considered gold standard. For neuro-ophthalmic field effects, we prefer kinetic perimetry done by Goldman. 
not done by Humphreys or Octopus. They are the two standard forms of perimetry, static perimetry, either Goldman, the big part, Octopus, or it can be Humphreys. Humphreys is usually more common. And or kinetic perimetry, Goldman. So, to summarize what I was saying, that perimetry can divide into two types static, where the stimulus does not move, and kinetic, where the stimulus does. Please remember, static is more useful for glaucomatous field effects. Glaucomatous field effects and kinetic is more used for neuroophthalmic field effects. This preferably optic neuritis, AION, and so forth. So, therefore, this is incorrect also. This A is incorrect, B is incorrect. Now, visual field effects are classified as glaucomatous only if they are associated with relevant optic nerve head changes or optic diseases. Absolutely correct, this is right? This is correct. The visual field effects, right? As right, that's why if they correspond to the optic disc now, so they should be corresponding. It cannot be that the optic disc is showing some other change and the visual field is saying something else. Okay, so this is correct. So please remember this answer C is correct and D we didn't have a choice, but this is a statement about static perimetry. So we'd probably definition of static we would say that static perimetry is a stimulus in which the stimulus does not move, we only increase the intensity short bursts and this is the definition of static perimetry. So, if we take that statement as correct choice, then C and D would be correct answer. However, since I do not know what the D choice is, in the absence of the D choice, I would say C. This is a good question because it is static and kinetic perimetry. Very well. The next question is the image indicates findings after administration of phenylephrine eye drops. So, we have two images of which we have been only able to get one here and which shows this nodule on the episclera or the sclera as the case may be and the question says the image indicates the finding after image of phenylephrine eye drops. So, remember when we have between episcleritis and scleritis because they are layers very close to each other, the one gold standard is to do the phenylephrine blanching test. Put a drop of phenylephrine could be 5 percent, 10 percent and phenylephrine blanches the blood vessel. So, if it is episcleritis, the redness would disappear immediately, it will become white. But if it is scleritis, because sclera is deeper behind, so the phenylephrine is not able to blanch or constrict the scleral blood vessels, so the scleral redness would remain as it is. Okay? So, remember in this case, you can clearly see the redness is still there. If it is still there, then so if it is still there, so that means the answer is going to be nodular scleritis. It is not a teen cyst. Episclerosis it would, would have been because the answer would have been episclerosis if it had become white. If it had become white and it was completely blanched because superficial, it blanches easily with phenylephrine. Nodular flicton is not the answer. Flicton is an antigen antibody reaction and the classic sign of flicton is pain. And on examination, if you do a fluorescent stain, you would have find the ulcer, an ulcer on the top of the flicton and that would have been. So, the sign of flicton is that on staining with fluorescein stain, it picks up the stain with a small ulcer at the top of the, of the flicton. The answer, ladies and gentlemen, here is nodular scleritis because it is completely red, branch at all. Very well, that wasn't a very difficult question. I hope you got it, most of you have got it correctly. And then this is a little tricky question in the sense that there is not enough information here. It says, what is the sequence of staining for a dry eye evaluation? Now, what does that mean? Sequence of staining for eye evaluation. You know that in keratoconjunctive sicca, there are multiple tests. You know, the multiple tests. One of the most useful ones are, of course, the, for the staining test. Now, what I think, what according to me, is that sequence of staining would mean that dry eyes typically progress first from the conjunctival dryness and then from the to the corneal dryness. So, usually the first conjunctive becomes dry and then the cornea becomes dry. As if you remember, the vitamin. A deficiency is ophthalmic classification of WHO, the modified WHO classification, where you know that X1 stands for the XN, sorry, let us start with the first XN, that is nyctalopia earliest, X1 stands for conjunctival dryness and X2 stands for corneal zero. So, in that sequence, if we look at that sequence, that is the ideal sequence, first the dryness hits conjunctiva and then the cornea, then the conjunctival dryness, remember, in that case, the conjunctival dryness, X1 is conjunctival dryness, X2 is corneal, bit confused by my terrible handwriting. So, conjunctival dryness is X1. So, in X1, remember, 
the stain of choice is lysamine green okay lysamine green is a stain which you just touch the uh, the conjunctiva with the stain and pick up the stain immediately green color stain very easily this is very useful you can also use a rose bengal but rose bengal is not used much nowadays very irritating and the patient gets hurt when you put up highly irritating and the patient may have a foreign body sense pain when you use rose bengal however both rose bengal and lysamine green they test for conjunctival dryness test for conjunctival dryness so we can i would suggest that we start with this this is number 1 in the absence of lysamine green which is not usually available sometimes rose bengal is number 2 and these would test both of them are test conjunctival dryness and then we go to the next stage of acs or dryness which is the corneal dryness and the corneal dryness is the best way best way to look for corneal dryness is our fluorescein stain fluorescein stain so in this case if we go sequentially and that is the correct sequence they are asking the sequence of staining is that we start with lysamine go to rose bengal both however both of them can stain the conjunctiva remember it's just that's more comfortable for with lysamine green but fluorescein stain is a stain for the corneal dryness these two are stains for the conjunctiva so if we take it this order if we take the inter intercept the interpret the question this so i would say the answer would be d which three is one two is next and the first is last because corneal staining means now you have very severe dryness with loss of vision so with that ladies and gentlemen we have finished this little sequence this of i don't want to take time of yours this is a rough cut and if you have any questions kindly ask me and we can discuss this later so i hope that you all done well i all the well done well but you not no. but just have plug on remember this medicine practice me thank you very much and all the best